Ferguson, director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first uh, speaker of the year, late, later this year than in other years, because we had a cancellation earlier on. Um, to introduce the speaker, though, I'm going to invite one of our own professors and a good friend of Nika and I, Margaret Newton, to uh, give us a little context, tell us a little bit about him. Well, we have here, as everyone literate can see, exactly who you are, what you're talking about. So we could say, you know, give me watch in, give me watch we go, ni gan we would on Sinclair, ni ma fi devotion. But I think it would also be fun if we had several of us chatted just a little bit in an impromptu kind of way, since your topic is bhagdagan, the idea of giving gifts. We'll give you our interpretation of that first, and then you can carry on to explain more. So we have for you, just to embarrass more than one person in the room, <laughs> <laughs> our Ojibwe poet laureate. I think the other thing that's worth saying is that Nigan is one of the people who regularly works to plan the Native American Literary Symposium. And Kim has long worked to do that, and so that is one of the ways that we know you. So we thought we'd give you this uh, fine remembrance of our current poet laureate, mm -hmm. and these would go with that. And then Cream City Review from our English department. It's like he won, right? He won. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm just kidding after this. I know. <laughs> and then the other things I had already planned to bring this for you, which is a shirt that has. When you come here to this place, what's always nice that I love about indigenous tradition is you go and you get to learn about the people who are there. So this is hello in all of the languages local right here to this cosmopolitan shoreline. So you have it in Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Menominee, Stockbridge, uh, the Lenni Lenape, which is what the Stockbridge use now, Oneida, and the Ho-Chunk. So we have a hello in all of those languages. But of course we can't resist because this is the shoreline where there are water panthers, the all Ojibwe. Chibiju Gatenamoen, Malki Dibendagazian, which is a panther saying, and it says that you belong here. So we're glad that you're visiting. And I have for you one little small rock from the shoreline. So Nigan is somebody that I have known for a long time, and he makes great contributions. Uh, both academically and socially. So he's often networking, making change, doing his own incredible research and scholarship, and bringing people together. Uh, the other thing is, Nigan would expect it, so you'll have to bear with it. I feel like you came from Manitoba up in Wienbeek, in that area. You come to a place where for us, other than Lake Michigan, which you're on the shore of, the largest lake that would be recognized in our state is also, you know, kind of connected that whole chunk area where we had in the south of Green Bay. So connecting these big bodies of water and the big lakes where you are, I think is important. So I'll give you two verses of the unity song in Anishinaabe one. So you can join them if you want, but uh, <laughs> it's a small room for this kind of thing, but that's okay, right? Yeah. 
heard me talk about a SEMA and tobacco. A SEMA is the beginner of a relationship. That's how a relationship begins. Um, or a gift. When you go to someone's house, for example, if I were to go up to uh, Opasque at Cree Nation or go to my home, Pegasus First Nation, go to, anyone, go to my auntie's house in Selkirk, uh, because half my, fa half my family still hasn't gotten their Indian status back and they recognize themselves as Métis. Um, if I were to go to my auntie's house, who's still the best, she, she has a false hip now, she's a broken, you know, like a replaced hip, but she's still the best rider of her jigger in one leg <laughs> of all time. Um, the first thing that she would do is she would invite me in and she would say, come in my boy, and she would greet me. And of course, at this point, I've known her long enough, but she'll probably, will talk about, talk about our family. But if I just met her for the first time, I'd share my name. And then she would offer me a cup of tea, or she'd offer me some, something to eat. And then she'd say, tell me, about my, tell me about your day, my boy. Tell me. Tell me what's going on. And then I would tell the story, and then at the end I would say, and you? Those four things, those four exchanges, are the fundamental premise, are the, the epicenter, the center of relationship making for really any culture of the world. And so um, when you go to any territory, you share four gifts. And that's usually a greeting, a name, some kind of gift or food, or um, some kind of exchange. Sometimes it can be something else. It might, it might even be a handshake. Uh, and then lastly, it's a story. Those are the four things you share with everybody. But for Anishinaabe, the exchange of those things, the acceptance of those things, once um, it's understood that these things are a process of relationship building, become law. And that's as simple as uh, understanding a visit to my auntie's house. So within Anishinaabe, within Anishinaabe cultures, particularly in Manitoba, this is the fundamental way that we see our ethics, the way that we treat one another. And the way that I'm using ethics today is I'm talking about the ways in which what we use in order to create relationships, not only with other human beings, but with everything around us, whether that be the animals, the sun, the water, or even a university administrative structure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about creation, because the, these things all stem from how do we create something. So to understand how th something is created, um, I happen to be at the University of Manitoba, uh, and how I like to describe the University of Manitoba, we have a, we have a, a big push right now to indigenize um, or de and decolonize. So right now in Winnipeg, there was a, just passed, I was just informed a couple hours ago, but um, it was just passed, and Meg's actually on the uh, advisory council of the University of Winnipeg. Um, so she was one of the me for this. Uh, but the University of Winnipeg has just passed unanimously the requirement that every single undergraduate who uh, attends the University of Winnipeg has to receive, uh, has to attend and uh, re receive, achieve credit in an indigenous themed course or an indigenous-centered course. That doesn't mean indigenous studies course, because that would be impossible, I think, for the indigenous studies department to handle. Instead, it's like, a, it's like a listing of 100 classes that fulfill the indigenous quotient, and then they have to fulfill that. So every single student, now that's only about 7,000 students, but that's pretty remarkable that all students in Winnipeg starting next year will do that. Now, Manitoba, we're significantly bigger, but we've been on a move to what we've been calling indigenous achievement for a long time. But the question that's been asked over and over again is do we indigenize or, we de or do we decolonize first? What are those two things? What, what, how do we indigenize? How do we decolonize? Is it the same thing? And so uh, that's where I'm going to start off by thinking about today is how do we create something out of this kind of interesting historical moment that we live in in Manitoba? But also how do we create it in universities? So, uh, with that long preamble, I'm going to start with my uh, I'm going to start with the story because um, you you heard my new hour talk today. My premise is that Anishinaabe studies always starts with the story. You start with the story. You look for what's the epistemological tenets in the story. Where's the knowledge embedded in the story? How is it practiced? How is it lived? And then you go from there. <clears throat> Science, geography, anything uh, is in Anishinaabe studies kind of begins in that way. So I'm going to say that, uh, I'm going to talk about creation story. Now the creation story I'm about to tell you is an abridged version, super quick. Uh, it's normally told over days, but I'm going to tell you in a very quick, and I'm going to use my very traditional PowerPoint. 
um, to uh, to enable and incur and, and uh, but you know if we were in a lodge we might be using sand we'd still be using writing we would still be using images if we were in the petroforms I would be using the petroform the rocks on the rock writing on rocks if I was out in the bush I might be using a tree I might be using a stick I might be using earth but writing has always been the expression of Anishinaabe. We have never not had writing. There's never been a time when we haven't had writing. We are the most literate people on par with any other civilization ever founded in the world. So this story is a very old story and it's been written down many, many times, but it starts with nothing. Nothing. Uh, Anishinaabek histories tell us that creation began with nothing, but that nothing was something. That something was nothing. So that something that was nothing was known as Gijay Manado. And so Gijay Manado comes from two words. The first is Gijay, vast, and Manado, which is often used to describe spirits. But um, I'm not using it to describe spirit this time. I'm using it the way Basil Johnson uses it, which is to describe essence. So Manado is meaning essence. The best way to describe Manado to you is to, if I was... I, I exist in Manito. I, I, if I was covered by water, I would be encompassed by Manitoke, right? So, so Manito is more like essence. So the great essence was in creation that was nothing, but Gijay Manito was that something. And that something began by hearing a sound. And that sound created a tiny ripple throughout creation. And that tiny sound was kind of like two stones coming together. Two stones, so if you hear those, ever hear that sound of two stones coming together? And that's why I, I was very honored you gave me one of your, one of your grandfathers. And so, so those two stones that came together, and if you hear them today, you hear them in those shakers that we use in our ceremonies. So you hear them shake, shaking four times, and that's talking about creation. That little, song, those two shakers that start in creation that, that are used for Anishinaabe songs is, the recognition that something is about to be created. It's the recognition that this is a time of creation. And so um, when, when creation began, it was through a sound. And that sound emanated throughout everything. Now, how many people have ever gotten a gift in your lifetime? Yeah, you got a gift? Yeah? Would, uh, hey brother, in the very back with the brown sweater, what'd you get? Um, a PlayStation. You got a PlayStation, nice. <laughs> awesome gift, who gave you the PlayStation? Uh, my grandmother. Your grandmother, nice. <laughs> now, that's pretty cool, I want that grandmother. <laughs> now, uh, that's pretty cool grandmother, did you ask her for it? Uh, yeah. You did ask her for it, okay, and she delivered it, she gave and brought it to you. Now, anyone ever got a gift, kind of an unannounced gift? Yeah, I got it, what'd you get? Uh, oh, good, you got, you got a shaker, good. I've never got an ugly sweater. <laughs> yeah, I got an ugly sweater. I see, you, I see you laughing there. Okay, who gave you the ugly sweater? My wife. Okay. <laughs> now, when you got the ugly sweater, did you go, wow, this uh, sweater is really ugly, and you just throw it on the ground and say, this sucks? No. <laughs> Why not? Because I value living. <laughs> yeah, you value life, right? Because you'd be sleeping on the couch for like a month, right? Or, <laughs> now, now here's the thing is, why did she give you the gift in the first place? She thought I would like she it. She thought you'd like it, right? And she cares about you. Now, when you got the gift, what did you say? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I love it. I love it. This is the best sweater in the world. <laughs> and then what did you do? Then what did she want you to do? Put it on. You gotta put it on, right? <laughs> now, why do you put it on? Why don't you just be honest with her and say, listen, this gift, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> Why'd you put it on? Why didn't you put it, throw it on the floor? Because I love her too. You love her too, right? Okay, so a gift always begets another gift, and your gift was to recognize the power of your, or the love that she gave. And the way that we recognize gifts is we often say, miigwech, or thank you. So the word for miigwech in Anishinaabe Moen uh, comes from the verb miigwe, which is to give. So in Anishinaabe Moen, you don't actually say thank you, which is kind of a passive act. You're showing gratitude, of course, but miigwech means I gift you back, or I, I give you back what you gave to me. And so 
Because you better do, when you get a gift, right? So the job of the gift is to use the gift, is to use, when you get a shaker, your job is to use the shaker. It's not to go in a museum, sit there under a glass case. That's not the job of that gift. The job of that gift is for you to use it, to use the PlayStation. Do you use the PlayStation? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> what are you doing here? That's what I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> now, now the, the job of what Kiji Menado realized in that moment, at that sound, was that sound was a gift. And that sound was inspired a beautiful vision of possibility. Kiji Menado saw this beautiful, amazing vision. It was so beautiful. So, so epically amazing, and it had all of these layers, all of these pieces, all of these, uh, <coughs> it was moving, it had all this beauty within it, because that gift was you. It was you. It was you, and it was you. It was you, and it was you. Gijem and looked through and saw this beautiful being, and it was you. But Gijem and didn't just see you now, Gijay Manado saw you now, and now, and now. So Gijay Manado saw you now, and now. Didn't see you now, saw you now. Okay, so how did Gijay Manado see you? <laughs> As a moving, beautiful, complex, full, complete being. Saw you when you were a child, saw you when you were an adult, saw you when you were an elder. Even saw it with everything that you would create out of your life, saw all of your children, your children's children, and also saw all of the beings that existed before you would exist too. Saw every single part of made you who you were. So Gishe Manado saw all of this, and this vision was a totally beautiful and complete creation. Because you do not exist as an island. Everything around you is connected to you, whether from the air, to the sky, to the stars, to the sun, to the moon, everything is a part of your life. And Gijay Manado saw it all. Saw you, but then also saw you. Now, when Gijay Manado saw all of those parts, she saw what Basil Johnson refers to as, quote, a vast sky filled with stars, sun, moon, and earth. She saw an earth made of mountains and valleys, islands and lakes, plains and forests. She saw trees and flowers, grasses and vegetables. She saw walking, flying, swimming, and crawling beings. She witnessed the birth, growth, and end of things. At the same time, she saw other things to live on. Amidst change, there was constancy. That's one of my favorite quotes of Basil. Amidst change, there was constancy. Kajé Manado heard songs, wailings, and stories. She touched wind and rain. She felt love and hate, fear and courage, joy and sadness. Kajé Manado mediated it to understand this vision. So in her wisdom, Kajé Manado understood that her vision had to be fulfilled. A gift is only valuable insofar that you use it. Just like your PlayStation, just like your, just like your shaker, just like your ugly sweater. A gift is only valuable insofar as it inspires the relationship possibilities that thought creates. This vision, this thought, came with many responsibilities. And the responsibility, first and foremost, is that Gajay Menado had to create this creation. So during seven fires of creation, as uh, Edna Manitowabi writes about and talks about in uh, Leanne Simpson's book, um, all of the parts of creation were made in a multi-layered fashion. So Gishé Menado made the sun, and I'm, I'm condensing the story very quickly, made the sun and sent it forth, made the moon, sent it forth, made the stars, sent it forth, the, the sky, the directions, the land, the water, the trees, plants, the animals, the fish. And Gijay Menado made every part of creation all together. This amazing, beautiful creation that looked so complex, but yet it looked like this. The difference between this, this beautiful creation, and us is movement, is motion. And that creation still hadn't, it would look like a painting. And so Gijay Menado had made all of these parts of creation. And so Gijay Menado realized that it needed to move because it was movement that created life. Through movement, Gijay Menado picked up every piece of creation and added a little piece of herself. And she did that through breath. And so picked up the stars, the sun blew in, the stars, the moon, the sky, the wind, the directions, and picked up each part of creation and instilled it with a special and unique gift that it would, it would use 
to be set forth into creation. Because as this beautiful vision was sent into motion, every part, every, every part had an individual gift that it was then tasked to share with everything else. So in other words, everything was part of a system. Everything was part of a system that moved. So when I teach about treaty, this is how I teach treaty to kids, to students, to, to uh, last week I spoke with the nuns of Manitoba, I taught the same thing. So, um, creation is all about treaty making. That when beings are sent into creation, when the sun is sent into creation and the moon is then added, it's like a big party. It's like, so everyone made a big party before, you know, you get your house ready, you get the cheesies ready, you clean up the house a little bit, right? And you get your first person that comes in, then you get your second person that comes, pretty soon the party gets kind of, it's kind of crushed, right? And then the person comes and they say, oh, can I just move in right here? That person's got to choose, that next, that being's got to choose to share space with you. And we make an agreement. We make an agreement to share that space. We make an agreement to, to work together within that space. And it involves necessarily and crucially movement. Movement is what creates treaty. Movement is what creates relationship. Without movement, there's no relationship. Now, the last to be created amongst all else was humankind. Now, humankind, in a long story as well, was created with Gijay Manado's specific gifts as well. Like other beings, humanity was given unique gifts to carry, or what we often refer to as a bundle. Uh, this bundle would help human beings exist within the universe, ensure their meaningful participation within it, and give them tools to live a happily and long life. So the bundle is made up of many rich and powerful things, language, a mind, body, heart, and spirit. And humankind was also given one special and unique gift, uh, and that's the power to dream. And Basil Johnson writes about this, the great uh, uh, Nowish, or Kate Croker, and Anishinaabe, who just recently left us. Um, and so she, he talks about this in Ojibwe Heritage as, uh, human beings were given that gift of dreaming, and that power of dreaming had two parts. The first is that it could dream any single thing possible, the second part is that dreaming could also destroy yourself. That dreaming could result in even the imagination of your own destruction. And you have the ability, just like Ajay Manado did, to see possibility, but you could also see possibility. And that is the contradiction of humanity, is that humanity has that incredible, powerful gift. Now, part of humanity's first bundle also included the ability to communicate clearly and easily with the sun, the sky, the plants, and the rest of creation. And these stories are well documented in Anishinaabe Moin as the Atazukonic, as the creation stories. The, uh, the communication between human beings and non-human beings was not uncommon at all, for the universe not only shared a common originator, but a language. In other words, everything in the universe could communicate clearly and directly with one another. Animals and peoples could talk. The only other area this exists within is children's literature, which shouldn't be a surprise, therefore, when Anishinaabe stories are then classified as kids' literature, especially the most sacred creation stories, because these are the stories that share common relationships with things like Disney. However, um, Anishinaabe stories, as Anishinaabe Adazukonic, illustrate a much deeper connection, a distinct connection with the earth itself through language. So the ability to communicate completely forged a peaceful synchronicity between creation and Anishinaabe creation for a long time. This doesn't last forever, because uh, as uh, many Anishinaabe storytellers will tell you, um, in our creation story, it talks about Anishinaabe forgetting these teachings, forgetting this ability to communicate, um, forgetting to live peacefully in and amongst each other. And as uh, Eddie Benton Benet writes in the Mishomas book, that the Himardi quote, the harmonious way of life on earth did not last forever. Men and women did not continue to give each other the respect needed to keep the sacred hoop strong. Families began quarreling. Villages began arguing. People began to fight. Brother turned against brother, brother and began, to, oh, I just broke into Pegasus there. You see that? Eh? <laughs> brother, brother, brother. Anyways, my old, that's my old, uh, my reserve speech there. And began killing one another. So at this time, universal order is forgotten, and that human beings turn away from the laws and the gifts in which they are given, and they begin to use their gifts in other ways. 
It's humans misunderstanding and the irresponsible use of their gifts, their dreams specifically, that fuels conflict and unease. Clearly the ability to communicate directly was not enough to maintain peace and harmony with beings endowed with special gifts. And so at this time, there's a, there's a great reminder that when human beings came to Earth, they were to have uh, keepers of them, people who would be keeping, beings that would be caring for them. Because when creation began, Eugene Menado called everyone together. And he called all the beings of creation. Says, "I'm going to make creation. I'm going to make one more last being, and those are human beings. And I need someone to take care of them. I need someone to give them places to live, uh, clothing to wear, food to eat, and finally give them names. And it was the animal beings, our Dodamak, who offered that wonderful sacrifice, that wonderful commitment to us. And that is the first treaty of the Anishinaabe. The very first treaty is with the animals." The first treaty is with that commitment that we have to those fish, to those birds, to those animals. But also the places in which they live. Because it doesn't matter how much you care about a fish, it doesn't matter how much you commit to a fish, a fish is nothing without the water. The water is nothing without the land. The land is nothing without the air. The air is nothing without the sky. The sky is nothing without the stars. The stars is nothing without the sun. And so on and so on and so on. So when these animals chose this commitment, it was the acceptance, the bringing them into family, that made them connected with everything else. And that just like a good gift giver, and by the way, the gifts that you get the most from your grandmother, who gave you your shaker? A friend. A friend, probably a family member or someone family-ish, mm -hmm. one who cares about you a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Because friends can become family, and your partner. It is family that knows the best about gifts. And we sometimes give gifts we don't even know about. They might be things like leaving the dishes undone. Sometimes the gifts that we don't like, right? <laughs> but it might be shoveling the snow. It might be taking them out for dinner. It might be telling them that I love you. Those animals are still giving us those gifts. Now, as I ended off before, I talked about the destruction of the first human beings. As, the, as human beings began to destroy themselves by turning away from human, from the animals, but specifically from all of creation itself, Gijay Manado knew that the, the earth had to be remade. And that is a famous story, of course, that talks about the flooding of the earth and, and the watery world that's created, and the, 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 uh, the rescue of that earth through the sacrifice of the muskrat. But, well, I really want to talk about the recreation of the earth. The recreation of the earth in Anishinaabe creation stories have to, has to do with beings who then are forced to, to, to communicate with one another beyond a direct connection, beyond a direct ability to communicate. While, while language at the first creation was not enough for beings to uh, be able to effectively live peacefully and harm, harmoniously, in the second creation, Gijay Manado created a creation that involved work, involved a whole set of commitments. And this is where breath comes in, because as Gijay Manado connected breath, it was through breath that maintained that connection with all things. So that breath that Gijay Manado, remember, made and gave the gift to the sun and to the moon, set it forth did so with human beings as well. It was the Gijay Manado's breath, the essence of breath, that connects all things. Without breath, vision has no form. And if we think about language now, language reminds us that regularly. Breath constitutes motion and movement because it is breath that delivers our visions, our, our great gifts. Our great gifts as human beings is that ability to dream. Dream creates life. When it, when it passes through breath. So breath gives thought form, and the breath of Gijay Manado is a force of energy. It's a reminder that we have expressions that we have to express the uniqueness of identities, and it makes every being who they are. So in Anishinaabe Moen, we might describe Anishinaabe as humanity, but we might also use it to describe the Ojibwe people, or you, you know, whether you stand in Manitoba, the Soto people, or the Bungi people, or the Chippewa people. But Anishinaabe also refers to all human beings as well. And that all of the peoples, and I love that that's 
That's a way that we both describe all humanity and then ourselves as a describer because it is a reminder that we are a part of something that's interconnected. We are a part of something. We, while we may talk about nationhood and hard borders, and especially in this world of nation statism, our nationhood is as much about connection as it is about separation. Okay, so I think that's really important because breath reminds us of that. So Kishi Manado's breath is the reminder that language forms the fundamental part of creation. It is, it is the very nature of language through breath that connects everything. If there's a building block to creation, it is breath, this creation. So Kishi Manado's breath is the first gift to creation. Creation is good, but it was, as you saw, a painting. It is breath that connects all things. That gift, Gijay Menado's gift, that we call as baggage again, or baggage again, depending on where you stand. Baggage again is what I'll be used today. Or what we use to describe an offering. So the word uh, baggage again also refers to, uh, it, it's what we use to describe an offering. It might describe a, a food. Um, it might describe uh, an offering of a relationship or a hand. But it also describes you releasing something to say that you can carry this too. And so Gijay Manado, as giving that baggage again in, that those gifts to creation, those offerings to creation, Gijay was, was, Gijay Manado was also saying to creation, you can create too. Creation is as much about me as it is about you. You have a role to play in creation because you are beautiful. You are an amazing being, and I saw all of these incredible possibilities in you, but you have jobs to do, and your job is to create, and the, way, the fundamental way that you do that, the building block of creation, is breath, is language itself. That as you share language, as you share your gifts, your gift of dreaming with creation, it is language that you will do that in. So what we describe this is, is Hindasuin, or Anishinaabe knowledge, so Anishinaabe knowledge is really anything that you dream, that you desire, that you think of, that relates to Anishinaabe people, that relates to Anishinaabe, what we Brisner refers to as survivance or continuance. But Anishinaabe knowledge specifically is about our experience within the universe as a people, as a community, but also as a community that's connected to all of it. So if language is the constituent part of creation and breath forms the basis for that language, that then we have to imagine that the world is built out of language, that the entire world is, if you look out, then words are everywhere. Creation speaks because all of creation has breath. So uh, the, fun, the premise that creation speaks is a hallmark of many Anishinaabe ceremonies and prayers. It's a tenant of our spiritual institutions. It's an under, underlying belief in expressions in oral and written traditions. Um, the idea, of course, is difficult at times to uh, think not anthropomorphically because we as human beings like to think as humans are the only beings of all things. We only, we're the only beings that matter. We're the only beings that speak. But um, we, we, of course, uh, use things to go, okay, well, you know, speech patterns, um, understandable speech patterns. Mm -hmm. But language expressed by non-humans and through methods like science, that science is continually arguing and illustrating to us, shows us that words are everywhere. Um, and that it is words, it is the sharing of language that, um, that ties creation together. And uh, I wish I had actually thought of that, that showing a few images here, but um, uh, I'm thinking now specifically of the ways in which animals speak. So the way bar bears mark trees that indicate, first off, my territory, but also, if you want to mate with me, this is how big I am, right? A very important lesson for bears out there. Um, I'm thinking of the expression that fish, that fish make of their home territories. I'm thinking of the, of the path that that sun travels in the sky. And that that sun, if you commit to that sun, that that sun will choose, and, and if you show enough respect and care of that sun, that sun will choose to be a part of your life the next morning. Words are everywhere. Language is the glue that holds creation together. So combined words form stories, songs, and other expressive forms that define relationships between beings. So in Anishinaabek, Kandasawin, this is a fundamental principle, as I mentioned before. 
So it, affiliations through language or the offering of language happens every moment, everywhere, through all beings. Anishinaabek, non-Anishinaabek, animals, plants, trees, sky, stars, every part has language embedded within it. And uh, we see that, the most marked way that you can see that is talk to a, an Anishinaabe elder or a storyteller about songs. And what's, well, the way that songs are described is the, the reminder that there are languages that exist outside of ourselves. That there's sounds in the cracking ice. There's sounds within the wind. There's sounds in that, uh, that bear. There's sound in the sun traveling across the sky. Um, Wab Canoe has a great, uh, have you heard of Wab Canoe uh, down here? You guys heard of him? Yeah. Okay, well he's a big hip hop artist, he's a big, big national celebrity up north, big Anishinaabe celebrity. He, he says that uh, it is, uh, the songs that come to him is when he's paddling on the water. And he'll create hip hop songs out of that to, re to remark that it is the songs of water passing that reminds him of hip hop. Um, if I had time I'd play that song for you. <laughs> So, um, Basil Johnson describes in his book, The Gift of the Stars, that Mother Earth is always teaching us, right? It's always speaking to us. And that what he says is that the Anishinaabe are, quote, told the most wonderful of stories with words, opening eyes to creation, recreation, life, death, transformation, beauty, good and harmony enacted by flowers, plants, shrubs, and trees, kinship with all beings sharing the same environment. So words are created from interactions who tell stories with words, but also without words, what we might not think of as words, and they blend together their findings to find a notion of morality, uh, a notion of morality and acts of togetherness. So beings around us, Johnson suggests, are not only inviting us to listen to, to feed, to read, to smell, to mimic, to touch their expressions, but also live alongside them in a relationship of mutual responsibility and reciprocity. They're inviting us into a relationship, or another way to describe that, is a treaty. Every being in creation participates in treaty making. And that treaty making is the invitation to that relationship. Now, Wisner also talks about this in uh, his famous story, Almost Brown, where he says, words are everywhere. Uh, you use this, uh, Kim uses this regularly. I realize that in a chance moment is what he writes. A chance moment is that opportunity of creation that I referred to, that in creation, creation exists when we see opportunity in a gift, in an offering. So Wisner, the words in creation not only inspires, but embodies that understanding and the possibility of interpretation and consideration in specific places and moments, but only if we see the opportunity embedded within it. The language that surrounds Almost Brown in that story is our complex invitations when he's hearing the ice cracking that assist him in understanding how he's intricately connected to the world and who he is. And this is what I'm describing. So, this is much more understanding, understandable if you're an Anishinaabe person. So we're t I'm really talking about the clan system here. I'm really talking about the ways in which we see ourselves and our, via our animal teachers, via our dodems, as showing us this model of creation. That while you may exist over here, and the bear may be over here, the sun is over here, it is breath that connects us all to one another but it's not easy, is it? It's not easy to hear the bear, because we are in the second creation now. It's not easy to hear that. At the first creation, no problem, you just phone up the bear. Hey, what do you want over there? Or you just phone up the sun. The sun would speak to you. In the second creation, it's harder work. You've got to look to, uh, there's other things, you've, you've got to use other parts of yourself, you've got to use others, other gifts. So the embeddedness of words throughout creation and the power of them, the breath, to harness life is a facet of other tribal traditions. To, in fact, it's pretty much a hallmark of almost every tribal tradition out there that it is breath or it is imagination. I'm thinking about uh, Mamaday's uh, man-made word essay. I just keep going, right? Uh, I can just keep listing them all off. It is, the, it, it is language that is embedded throughout creation. And it is not that we find language, it is that language finds us. And that we pick up that language when we, listen to, when we listen to it. And that is a, a fundamental argument 
why our traditional ancestral languages are so important to us, because uh, I spoke about this a little bit at noon, but that it is our ancestral traditional languages, our Anishinaabe Moen, our Nihewap language, our Dakota language, it is those things which continue to point to us all the time to the value of our relationship with the earth. In that we own nothing as human beings. The only thing that we truly own is our relationship to things, our relationship to the earth. We don't own the earth, as uh, many people, or many of our elders remind us. We own our relationship to the earth. A um, little difficult to argue that with the bank. <laughs> now, um, the indigenous philosophies of language, I'm really moving towards an indigenous philosophy of language here, but I've used Anishinaabe Moen to do it. And that um, it is that the veins of thought, the veins of thought of humanity, um, for Anishinaabe Moen anyways, for Anishinaabe people, is that we didn't invent language. And human beings are also not the sole creators of language. This is a really radical idea. And it's one that's really important to, is that language is a shared endeavor. And it's not a shared, it's a shared endeavor that's not only anthropomorphic, it's not only by human beings itself, but it's through our relationship with things that we find words. So this, of course, diverges from anthropomorphic theories that posit that the human beings are the grand purveyors of all things, or at least meaningful language anyways. And it really complicates the monotheistic ones that suggest there's only one universal language, usually spoken by some um, godlike being, and then all of us kind of are derivatives of that. Um, unfortunately, this has been a trademark, as Kim has written, within, uh, you know, for particularly in the 1980s, it starts to become a kind of hierarchy or a modernist way in which indigenous languages and indigenous literatures are classified. If you don't buy into a particular sort of set of understandings, then therefore you get put in the children's literature section. You get put into, you don't get the academic jobs. Now, one thing that's become very clear to me is that nobody owns words. Every word comes from somewhere. Some are heavier than others. But yet, this will begin to force us to think. This little premise, just this little idea that I've talked about from Anishinaabe creation <coughs> stories, means a radical change or a radical challenge to then knowledge itself and the way that we recognize value, indemnify knowledge in our academic institutions. Because if we begin, uh, if we begin with just the simple premise of what is knowledge and how do we value knowledge, the story that I just told you from Anishinaabe tradition, the Anishinaabe creation story, posits enough challenges that we then have to look at the entire university as a whole and go, wow, do we ever have a lot of work to do? <laughs> Because a lot of work to do begins by looking at the one place that we celebrate, honor, or you know, recognize knowledge is valuable. It is only that in the library where we find the knowledge is valuable, or that's the primary tenet anyways. If you ask my student, you know, most students don't even today know what a library is, I say, well, where do you go? And they go here, all right? But generally, a library looks like this, right? So, so um, if we look at a library, it is the place in which words are found, the place that we, words that have value are found, the place that we place words that have, the place that we, we take words that we may uncover from our creation, but we put into this place. Well, the, the problem is, is that when I, when I describe the, the notion of language from Anishinaabe, from an Anishinaabe creation story, is that language is then found here. You know, language is, 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 this is the home of language. The home of language, or where words exist, is within this world. And that these are the Anishinaabe language, these are the Anishinaabe libraries, right? And so the closer that we might have, we might have a complicatedness in be, being able to say that text exists here, that authors exist here, that not only expression exists here, but offerings themselves exist here. And that our existence or as an academic researcher, for example, involves ourselves having relationships because it is language itself that we seek. It's language that we seek to uncover, but we have to create a relationship with, with this place, and it might involve a different sort of publication. It might involve a different sort of interviewing. It might involve a different sort of ethics. Now, it's been well documented at this point um, on how the challenges that indigenous writing poses to the institution. Um, because 
These things we will find in most anthropology departments, but you'll find them more and more in indigenous studies departments. As indigenous writing systems begin to receive um, a tiny share of the uh, recognition of having uh, literacy first off, second is knowledge that's valuable and worthy, second, and then third is stuff that's theoretical. So that the Mayan creation stories, the codices, um, the, uh, the writings of the Anasazi, cave paintings of the Dakota or the cave paintings of Manitoba, um, all the rock faces, and then also our birch bark scrolls, those scrolls that have been in now existence for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, um, as the repetition continues, that these things have knowledge bases and they are indigenous publishing. But they're a different kind of publishing than we might think of. They're not the kind of publishing that you might uh, have a dean recognize, not that, that, not that I've had any experiences like that. <laughs> But you might, you might have a difficulty having a dean understand that this sort of publication record, or what Jim Dumont calls a corridor of Anishinaabe publications that begins in Bawating, or Sault Ste. Marie, and moves west throughout the Great Lakes. I don't know if there's any in this territory, but certainly north of you, all throughout uh, North Michigan, going all the way up through northwestern Ontario, ending off with the petroforms of Manitoba, which I didn't include in this slide. But, um, People like uh, Gordon Brotherston, you know, this book is still, I think, relatively unknown or not as well known as it should be. Um, the Book of the Fourth World, which is now dated, kind of old, um, but it still has, it is one of the very first recognitions by um, academia, you know, a major press, I think it's Oxford, uh, publishing, publishing a, uh, a premise that indigenous writing systems for tens of thousands of years talked about experience. They talked about cultural, intellectual, political, and physical histories. They told stories. They were creative. That's the thing that I always kind of get bothered by is that uh, we can't forget that as much people were writing down history on those uh, on hides, animal hides, they were also just having fun. They were telling jokes. They were making sex jokes, too. Like, like indigenous life is all about creativity. As Remember that dreaming, you know? And that breath is as much about having fun telling jokes as it is about narrating a sacred story. So these indigenous writing systems had ex explanations and names, lands and maps, laws and land claims. And more and more, I've now been in court now six times in three years, arguing for indigenous writing systems um, as having merit within law. And that indigenous knowledge systems they have that land claims, we have to think about land claims differently if we think about birch bark scrolls or if we think about, if we think about writing systems of petroforms because these things might, we might think of them as land claims, but then who decided that this piece of paper with a bunch of squiggly writing is a land claim? Who made that determination? And the offering of breath really begins to challenge because it says, how do we begin to study how do we begin to recognize knowledge as valuable? Um, how do we even make a map? Because I want you to look, this is Manitoba, or Manitowobble. And uh, so my home is just over here. Our, our reserve is here. We used to be here, but they forcibly removed us. And so, um, but this would be a typical map that we would study in a geography department. Right, in a geography department, we'd say, okay, well, here's a map of land. We'd study land, we'd study borders, maybe. We might study our waterways. We might study, uh, we study the political borders, the ideological borders, and so on. Well, the, the issue is, is that if you go to an indigenous community, particularly in the 19th century, and you say, tell us about where you live, is that you get a map like this by Che Pewiti, who's a northern Cree, uh, you know, Cree traveler, coming home from the Paw to Split Lake. And he says, here's all the people I'm going to meet. This is how I get home. And so, um, this is a really fundamental shift to, way, to the way in which you see land, or if we were to say, well, what is indigenous geography? Well, here's how geography looks for, for many, especially in schools, but it, for indigenous geography, it involves centrally around relationships. It's centrally around the gifts and the breadth that we were talking about earlier. So what constitutes knowledge and how is it understood? We, we then, we've already sort of blown up the idea of writing and re reading and writing and literature, expression, imagination, signs and signifiers, or semiotics. And more and more I've been in court um, to, uh, to make arguments to say that indigenous studies is not the place where the stories and the kind of quaint 
little stories that you often see in children's literature sections, but we actually do legal work. And, we, and our legal work is probably the most fundamental gifts that we give back to our communities today. So right now, Manitoba um, wants to build another Manitoba hydro dam. And you know, I like electricity too, but six of them is getting a lot. And Lake Winnipeg is very, very sick. And we've cut off the, the drainage system from Lake Winnipeg to the Hudson Bay that goes up through the Nelson River, Churchill River. And as you go up through this area, we've created so many Manitoba hydro dams that we've affected the ecological system. And now Lake Winnipeg has somehow circumvented the Great Lakes as being the most threatened lake in North America. How we beat the Great Lakes is kind of a feat. It's kind of unbelievable that we're able to do that. But the Alberta tar sand, which is in the Lake Winnipeg watershed, is a great contributor. All the way in Alberta, that, that flows right into Manitoba. But what I've gone to court to say is that the argument that the court has made is that the consultation process has to involve the First Nations that are in and around this area. So if they want to build a kiosk generating station right here, you have to consult with these First Nations who are most directly affected. Well, my argument is, is that if you, took an, if you talk to Indigenous peoples themselves and you talk to Indigenous studies or you talk to Indigenous archives, you'd know that it affects everything. Because Che Pewiti told you two centuries ago. Two centuries ago, and it's textual. So you know what this is? This is called a land claim, but it's not the kind of claim that is, involves the domination of territory or the owning of territory. It's say, I own relationships. And it's my work with relationships that involve all these people. My auntie over here, my cousin over here, here's where I am on this map over here. And that all of these things, by creating a dam here, it affects the relationships all throughout all the lakes. So reading maps begins to become very complicated because maps then change from looking like this to this. That's be the closest thing that I think we begin to start to say, well, what is an indigenous mapping department look like? And we'd see this. We'd start seeing this. We might even start to see this because it is through the imagination or through the breath, the expression, and that I want to emphasize that breath is only one way to think of breath because breath itself involves semiotics and expression. The bears aren't just speaking to us through breath, they're also speaking to us by marking those trees. We, we speak through many ways, through many ways of seeing our land and our territory. And that it is through the complex contrib contributions of writing and reading and literature and expression, all of these things that then take us, take us all the way back to the beginning question that I asked at the beginning, is how do we begin to take these ethics, these positions of understanding, just a little hint of Anishinaabe uh, expression, ideas, culture, and community, like just a little tiny bit, and then challenge the two preeminent forms that we honor or recognize within university structures, research. So some questions I just want to throw out there, and then maybe we can have a discussion, or I don't know how long do we have. Are we over? Another half hour. Another half hour. Well, some of the things I want to talk about is um, how do we then take our, our very brief understanding of what constitutes an Anishinaabe research record and how does research then become about owning rela relationships with things and how does that then turn into a publication record? So as somebody who's just gone through the tenure process, my job is solely to show everything, all the squiggles in the paper that I've done. Anything else doesn't involve research. And I know that because I've tried it. Even testifying at court doesn't count as research. But if I write a report for court, it does. So these are very interesting fundamental ways that the university is built on squiggles on a line. Okay? That involve research, that indemnify research in a particular pattern. That Anishinaabe, I've just told you a tiny little bit, and I don't expect you to be an, ex an expert of Anishinaabe. Uh, I, I expect one or two people to be. But but, but to be, to be, you know, to what would an Anishinaabe publication record, if we're truly to incorporate indigenous ideas within an institution, do we have to decolonize first, or do we indigenize? And if we indigenize, then what do we just sort of have a separate section on there to go, okay, well, Anishinaabe research, or do we begin to question the whole notion of research itself? I haven't even got into teaching yet. So teaching, 
Now, if you add into teaching, I've had to do this whole, pro you can just tell I just finished the tenure processing. So I'm like, so if you go into teaching now, and then what, what constitutes teaching? And how does, what are the ways in which you, you uh, create your classroom? And what do you teach? Uh, what's a textbook, for example? What are the ways in which you then produce also materials that you teach? What are the assignments that you use? And I think teaching is probably the closest area where the faculties of education are constantly pushing that boundary, but then you get into standardized tests, right? Or required courses at universities, which is, which is I think the problem that the University of Winnipeg is gonna have to grapple with, is that if you're gonna indigenize your curriculum, then does it look similar, like what happens when it's in um, chemistry? Or what happens when it's in the humanities versus chemistry, versus astronomy, and so on. And that I, different ways that indigenous knowledge comes into and affects and shapes teaching is different. And we talked a little bit about that in, was it after our talk at noon? Is that, so for example, an Anishinaabe teaching way would be to have multiple instructors in multiple languages at the same time. So you'd have a, uh, um, that's just one simple way of, uh, of talking about if you're to teach something, you always have to teach something at least more than once, with more than one more than one teacher, more than one speaker. And as I said at lunch, I'll say again, uh, this is really an argument. All you union people should be all over me by now and like <laughs> holding me up and stuff like that. So because that involves more faculty positions, right? So what it, what does an Indigenous Studies department look like when you have multiple teachers, multiple speakers in multiple languages? Because that is the way in which the stories are intended to be taught. That's the way in which the stories have to be, that's the way the stories carry that knowledge. They carry the breadth and the possibility that are embedded within them. Now lastly, service. Now you're talking to a guy that spent uh, two years um, demonstrating against a, uh, I, this is being taped so I, I wanna be careful. Uh, <laughs> uh, against a, uh, we'll say, a, a very strong-willed government who uh, was very, a resource-based agenda. So we've just come out of 10 years in Canada of um, a very resource-aggressive government. And I may not get in the country if you put this online until after I get back, so, you know. But we've now changed that. So now, after 10 years, we've changed governments. Um, so what, what does it constitute as service? So I had an interesting experience with service. So service involves me going to a, a community, speaking to elders, uh, maybe working with somebody collecting the stories, but it doesn't involve me going to speak at a uh, protest march about the power of water. That's not service. That's political. And so that's a very interesting way. So to go and advocate for earth and water and land can only be done in a particular framework involving um, usually data collection or something that seems not quite as threatening. And these are interesting ways that we might think of as our use of breath or our use of dreaming. And that which is the ways in which that, that practice um, is, is uh, recognized as having value, as having value within the institution itself. So those are just a few questions that I wanted to ask about these sections. We can talk really about anything that we want um, involving uh, the challenges that Anishinaabe ethics or the idea of breath and gift giving. Uh, might might uh, contribute to our larger larger conversations at both Indigenous Studies but at the University at large. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I just want to say miigwech for all of you listening and for inviting me to a great university. I really appreciated having an opportunity to share this knowledge. So miigwech. So uh, you want to take questions? Is that what you want to do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll just sip my coffee while I'm doing that. So. <laughs> okay. So how did the courts react to your argument after, you know, with the map and everything? Well, the courts? Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've appeared six times. So, and each time, um, there's, there's really interesting, I mean, every process is different. So right I'm appearing in two weeks to the, uh, the National Energy Board on the East Energy Pipeline. So the, uh, what they want to know is they want to know, or what they've said is that they want to know why would Pegwis First Nation, I'll just show you. Okay, so Pegwis First Nation's up here, and East Energy goes here and then down this way. 
Okay? So they were like, well, why does Pegwa's First Nation have any say in their way up here? And even if even their traditional territory over here, that still doesn't cross East Energy. It doesn't affect East Energy. And so I've had to make an argument for relevancy first. So I've been successful 50% of the time in getting Pegwa's First Nation represented at hearings. So we've, been, we've fought about 15 times and we've been able to get into six court processes, now seven. Um, but every single time I'm given 15 minutes and, t and about, I'd say at least half my time, seven to eight minutes is going, here's why we matter. But what a waste of time. Why don't we just wreck, like, so I basically have to argue historical use and occupancy. I have to argue for relationship. I have to argue Anishinaabe cosmology in eight minutes. And then I have to go hammer this all through. And then I have to say, and here's what the pipeline would do to, to culture, tradition. Here's how it would affect our traditional uh, hunting, fishing practices. But here's how it would just affect relationships with other First Nations in Treaty 1. So the more effective way, what we found is we found it better to join together as treaty members and to sort of speak uni unilaterally as a treaty. But now with East Energy, so the National Energy Board has done two really interesting things in Canada. Now don't forget this, they're the former government's appointees, not the current government's appointees, just their brand new government about a month old, is uh, they've banned consultants, they've banned university professors, but they've allowed, and they've banned anyone, they're not, they've banned any questions about science or any comments about science. You're only allowed to talk about traditional knowledge and only if you're a community member. Well, luckily, I'm the only one that can do that because I'm a member, right? I'm a Pegwis member, and, but I, I am not allowed to refer to the fact that I'm a professor. So I got a memo about that. They said, you're not allowed. Look, I'm going to not even get back in the country now because you don't put this online. Not okay. till Tuesday. Okay. okay. So, um, so it's a very complicated kind of ongoing process, I think, with... Um, I've had much bigger failings, in fact, at university than I've had arguing with, the, with judges. Like, for example, I've had a lot of uh, difficulty illustrating Indigenous research, what we might consider Indigenous research, with deans. In, and not just for myself, but for other colleagues. Because um, uh, if, if it's not peer-reviewed and put on a piece of paper, then it's not valuable. So. And I'm not here to say either way, but I'm here to say that there are certainly ways in which um, gift giving, uh, oh, here's another, here's a problem. So I, I make all my students, if they're gonna work with an indigenous community, they have to give gifts to them. What's the number one ethics rule? No gift giving. <laughs> <laughs> so serious problem when it comes to ethics. So, that, so the first thing that they have to do is when they come to somebody and they say, you know, I just wanna spend time with you, Here's some asema, and if you heard me speak at lunch about asema, asema is the conduit of relationship. It's the way, and because when asema is accepted, you would commit to a relationship with somebody. And they might not understand that relationship, but it's a lifelong process, because relationships aren't figured out overnight. That's why you have a friend that becomes a family, right? Or a roommate that becomes a friend and a family, or whatever. That's, that's called a treaty process, right? So, so that, that asema is us going, okay, everybody, we're gonna commit to that relationship. It might not be perfect, but as long as you treat that asema the way that I treat that asema by giving it to you, that hundreds of hours I spent growing it or working for it or whatever, you and as long as we have that asema, we'll always have a relationship if we commit to it. And I might give you more gifts as we go along. I might give you my hand, I might let you watch my daughter, I might, um, I might name my child after you, I might, we might even get together and we might uh, work together on a project, whatever. I might even eventually call you sister. That's what that asema starts. That's breath. So if we do that, but the ethics doesn't let you do that. So I just <coughs> tell my students, don't tell them about the tobacco. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna do it anyways. And then if we, if we get busted later, we'll just deal with it. So. It's like, it's like right up there with the, like I think a lot of people, a lot of issues are obvious, you know. Um, one of the things we tackle with is elders being recognized as professors. All of us had to, have had to deal with that at some point. But I think that what I'm trying to show today is that there's much, you know, much broader stuff that's also going on within our university structures that are very complicated. And uh, Anishinaabe hopefully complicates these things. And if we're truly to look at reconciliation, where I, I think I started this talk by talking about reconciliation, this reconciliation project that's going on within Canada. Everybody's talking about whether we indigenize or we decolonize. So do we make new space or do we try to, you know, 
just add on what we got, we indigenize things, or do we decolonize by taking a whole look at the ethics process completely and restart again? Another question up there? Okay, yeah. Are gifts always among humans, or are there gifts to non-humans as well? I would presume that would be the case. But. Yeah. Well, the reason why I use the ugly sweater metaphor, and you guys are free to use that anytime you want, um, but because gifts aren't always the prettiest things, and they aren't always, like human beings, remember that the, the gift of dreaming has two parts. The first, that we can dream anything that we want. The problem is that we can dream anything we want. So we can dream about beauty and life and gift giving and uh, names and songs. And we can also make the atom bomb, right? So, so gifts, uh, so for instance, Lake Winnipeg, the sickest lake, in, uh, the most threatened lake in North America, is very much a gift to all of us. And we, we as human beings participate in gift giving that can also destroy ourselves all the time. The atom bomb is the easy way to see it, but Lake Winnipeg right now is literally suffocating ourselves because we want oil, because we want, pig, we want great food on, in Manitoba and we ship out all of our food so we cake the whole province with pig fertilizer that ends up in Lake Winnipeg. Uh, we use shampoo that ends up in Lake Winnipeg. We end up, we, we release the sewage from the city of Winnipeg five days a year, ends up in, ends up in Lake Winnipeg. It's because of the, so Winnipeg, um, I've written an essay about this, but Meg can also tell you a little bit about this. The word Winnipeg means, uh, it means clouded water, um, but it's referring specifically to the algae in the water. It's referring to that algae. That's why um, that word is an ecological commitment. If you use that, so I say to people in Minute Manitoba, I say, look on your driver's license, that reminds you, don't put pig fertilizer on the soil, because that results in more Winnipeg. So that word Winnipeg is an ecological commitment. It's a gift. It's a huge gift that reminds you that you could kill yourself if you want. And hey, surprise, surprise, we're killing ourselves. Because we want more food, we want oil, we've choked the life out of Lake Winnipeg by damming it all up. So it's like a trickle here. And Lake Winnipeg, now we can't swim there. Fish, um, fish are only in pockets. This is another interesting thing if you wanna know a little politics in Manitoba. So fish are only in pockets right here because algae production ends up on the east side of the lake. So you know, non-coincidentally, all First Nations communities, all, all towns. And so the towns here are like, the fishing's that never, have been the greatest it's ever been. All the First Nations communities can't fish. So, that, so it gets very little attention because on the east side of the lake is all the native communities. West side of the lake, people are like, this is amazing, fish is amazing. It's because the fish are all running here, that's the only place they can live now. Because the algae production is overproduced there. So. Okay, so a gift is a, a gift is a complex thing. And Lake Winnipeg, as I write in this essay, which I'm giving to you, is Lake Winnipeg is uh, is speaking to us. This is breath. Algae is breath. So the shampoo is not a gift to Lake Winnipeg because it's not given with love and therefore it's responded to by the lake in a different way. But presumably, would you, that one could give gifts of love to the lake. I'm just well, interested in the question of reciprocality. For sure. Among gifts are not always the best. It's not just among humans. We, remember that the, the, the gift of dreaming, so the, the offering of dreaming, that was by Gajay Manado, we could create amazingness we could create the atom bomb. So both of them are, are within our means, within our abilities, to give that gift to creation. And we, we, we might not think of it as a gift, but those things are just as impactful, influential, as any other gift in creation. We can create gifts that make beautiful life. We can create gifts that destroy. It's what you do with the gift. It actually doesn't really matter what you do with the gift. It's how you implement the gift, how you deliver the gift. Because the ugly sweater, the ugly sweater is a good reminder of that. You may never wear that sweater again, but you recognize that it comes from, it might come from love. Because I'll tell you that I've spent time with people from Manitoba Hydro. All they want to do is create power down here. They want people to have healthy, happy, or they want happy, profitable lives. That's what they want. It comes from good sentiment, 
this is my glass half full way of seeing it, comes from good sentiment, but unfortunately it's killing us. Probably back in the day the atom bomb had a similar argument. Mm -hmm. Now that I just, it's for the good of the world. That's a terrible thing, what a terrible thing. Uh, and then thank you very much, no, <laughs> what a terrible way to end. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the tribe in Canada. I'm just uh, being a tribal member here in the United States. I'm just trying to see if there's any differences or, or anything different with First Nations in Canada. Like, uh, how, 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 do you know how many tribal members are there? How many tribal members are there with your tribe, you know? I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot. That's great. Okay. Well, I mean, there's 600 First Nations in Canada. Mm -hmm. About 250 of them live in British Columbia. Um, and so that leaves about 350 for everyone else, which is very complicated when it comes to voting in a national chief, which is the way that the government recognizes somebody to speak on behalf of First Nations people. Impossible, obviously. And so, uh, but my, you want to know about my particular tribal nation? So, so my tribal nation is a, a place called St. Peter's Indian Settlement, which in 1907 <coughs> we were forcibly removed by gunpoint from this territory through an illegal vote, a sham vote, where everybody was paid. Nobody really knew why they were voting. Long story behind why that is, I won't get into it, but I'll just say that it was a sham. We were paid $121 million in compensation five years ago for this uh, removal in 1907. And then we were forcibly removed to Pegwas First Nation, which is up there. Um, so we're we're uh, from the Soto territory. So the Anishinaabe and this of us comes from Soto, from the uh, from the Bawating people, the Bawating immigrants who came from uh, west and then up north in the Red River from Sault Ste. Marie, and they came Soto, Sault Ste. Marie. And so when they came and they moved up north into Manitoba, they settled with a group of people at the Netley Creek. And the, um, they did that about 1700. And it's part of the Anishinaabe migration, right? So people continuing to move um, to the west. And so when we ended up there, we ended up smack dab in the middle of a very bustling Red River, uh, Métis slash French and British, a whole bunch of people all settling in that area all in the same time. We happened to arrive a little bit early. We joined with a Cree community that was decimated by smallpox. Um, we joined together and created the St. Peter's Settlement, which was the, the most Christian, successful agricultural settlement until 1907, and then we were forcibly removed to here, to Pegwas First Nation. So in very, very much ways, there's lots of things going on in my First Nation. The first is a real complexity between traditional and Christian, and because we've been going on you know, 200 years of Christianity, when Chief Pegwas chose to convert himself, he has to catch, cast off the Medewin and the, uh, his own son, who was in charge of the Medewin Lodge, so we still have that big fight in our community, Christian and, and traditional. And then we also have this kind of weird commitment because there's people like my family stayed behind while everybody was forced legally removed. So we were allowed to squat on, on farmer's lands that was once our own, and we moved into Selkirk. So for many years, until the 1980s, uh, we weren't allowed, we weren't thought of as Pegwas members until we eventually uh, applied to Pegwas collectively and then got re reaffiliated with Pegwas. But for many years, I was Métis. So for most of my life, I was actually Métis until the late C30, C31 and 83 because my, um, my grandfather went to fight in World War II. So I've always been Anishinaabe, raised Anishinaabe, but had a Métis card until 83. And then Bill C31 brought all of the soldiers who, who gave up their Indian status to go fight in the war, brought them back into the fold. I'm giving you a lot of Indian politics in Canada in like one little <laughs> story. So there's a whole bunch of different, it's a whole course on this <laughs> that I teach, so yeah. yeah. What would that put your tribal members at then? That We're about 7,000. We're one of the yeah. largest First Nations in Western Canada. But the ones, the Blackfoot ones out in Alberta, um, the Cree ones out in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they're quite big. But we're probably the biggest in Manitoba, or one of the biggest in Manitoba. Do they implement blood quantum to define membership? Like they do with no, so the, the Indian Act in Canada has Section Six, which ha it means that you have to have two status parents to get to continue your status lineage, or if you're a six-two, meaning you're half, you have a non-native mother um, or father. Uh, there's so many things I'm not telling you right now, but I'll, just, I'll leave it really simply. Okay, um, you can go be with a six-one, a full blood-ish. And then you can go back to having children that are full blood. So a half and a full makes a full. So it doesn't make any sense, I know, but I'm doing my best to describe a really complicated process to you. Um, the Indian Act also had really silly provisions in it for many, many years. 
Um, one of it being that if you're a native woman marrying a non-native man, you immediately lost status, and the Indian agent ousted you out of your community. Um, so in Bill C-31, that was supposed to bring those women back, but it only brought about half those women back. So it was the women and the soldiers who were brought back into the fold. So a lot of, but in the meantime, if you were a non-native woman marrying a native man, you immediately got status, you were considered full blood. And so, um, so a lot of indigenous parents, like certain celebrities, who I may have mentioned in my speech, um, have non-native parents, but they're six ones. They're considered full blood Indians, even though they don't have a drop of indigenous blood. And so, you know, there's lots of complexities in Canada around the Indian Act and things like that. Uh, if I were to explain it to you all day, I'd just be here for another hour, trying to explain to you the Indian Act or the Enfranchisement Act or the Gradual Civilization Act of 1850 or the Bugot Commission of 1840, 42. These are all dominoes. And as I said before, in my noon hour talk, everything starts with the Papa Bulls of, 15, of 1540, uh, 1450. <coughs> All of these papal bulls that are implemented by the church that basically say Christian, Christian nations are there to inherit the world, all of those things result in what's 2015 in Canada. You get rid of the papal bulls and the dominoes will all eventually fall. It'll take billions of dollars of law firms and, and, and arguments, but that, that's the first domino, is that papal bull in the fourth, 15th century, 14th century. Okay, last question. I don't know, how do we get into Papal Bulls? Remember, we're talking about good Anishinaabe stuff here. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, know, you mentioned these kind of different fields and indigenizing them. And, um, you know, I think about this, you know, my cousin who uh, teaches ecology, he teaches in the sciences and engineering. I, I, I'm not sure that uh, the sciences are, I, I like what you're talking about in terms of sciences being the kind of discourse of this the language of nature, right? I'm not so sure that that they aren't already potentially kind of moving towards an indigenous worldview. Because it's, you know, like you said, it's because, uh, uh, you know, the uh, previous prime minister and his guys didn't want science mentioned, right? They didn't want, uh, they want this idea of infinite resources that they could just collect in no sort of relationship between this and that. <coughs> These are the kind of stories that contemporary science tells. Uh, yeah. In the same way that indigenous people I mean, a different, so, different media, obviously. So my book is with uh, University of Minnesota Press. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were doing the book, uh, I was in English. But, <laughs> but uh, about halfway through, my advisor said, yeah, well, you're gonna have to get botanists. You're gonna have to get a botanist on your committee. And then, and then, and then, half, then about a month later, he's like, actually, I think you need an, anim an animal behavioral scientist on your committee now. Mm -hmm. And then, so now I'm, I'm going like, oh my god, like now I gotta, and then, so, all the humanities started to be sort of dumped off my committee because I started talking about, um, so what my argument is is that by understanding the clan system, you could understand the lens in which the offering is that Anishinaabe make through storytelling. Because in the clan system is every conduit, every relationship that we have. So remember the animals are the ones who agreed to look after us. And so they're the ones who teach us. So if you look through any animal, you can understand water, earth, sky, moon. You can understand anything that involves your relationship with creation through the animals. And so, yeah, it ends up being a whole lot of science research. And, and I end up being, a, I, you know, I've said many times that to be, um, to be an Indigenous Studies professor, you have to also be a historian uh, and uh, art historian. You have to be a fine arts person. You have to be uh, sometimes a psychologist, whatever. You have to be all, then now, you really have to be a scientist as well. Like you have to understand intricately science and you have to understand uh, astronomy. Most, some of the some of the big elders that I know would easily be able to lead an astronomy first year course, like easily teach a whole thing. Yeah, I, so I agree. There's a lot of really interesting things in science, but there also is the illusion in science of objectivity. And I find that to be um, in kind of the foundational problem within the faculty of science at the University of Minnesota anyways. There's this sort of illusion that science is somehow objective and without politics and without, without um, that, so the, the, premise that, the premise that I always use is that you can never see all of a tree. There's never a time in your life you can see all of a tree. You can only see part of it. You can see a lot of it, but you'll never see all of it. So no matter where you stand in creation, you'll never see all of a tree. And, so, and that's a teaching from the tree of life. So that's a tree of life teaching. 
And so that's where I learned that from the lodge. So that, because when you sit at a tree, you never sit at the same tree in the same way. And that's our initiation ceremonies for Medewin, Medewin people who are here. That's, our, that's that teaching about the tree of life. So the tree of life holds up creation, but you can never see all of the tree. That's why mystery, that's why mystery and complexity and contradiction is a crucial part of who we are as, as Anishinaabe people. That's why, uh, so our definition, I talked about this a little bit before, but our, our de William Warren's uh, definition that we're spontaneous people is a, you know, a real foundational note here because uh, spontaneity is nothing without cause. So there is no spontaneity without cause. So spontaneity comes from cause. So you need to have something that brings forth spontaneity, and that's usually mystery. Most often, that's called spontaneous combustion, right? So because we don't know what it is. So mystery, is mystery, contradiction, complexity, and science has trouble with that. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, I think about the arguments that involve you know, is there a God? Is there, you know, like, oh, we can't, we can't, like, for instance, uh, one of the things in my thesis, I talk about bear clan people. I talk about bear clan people as being medicine because um, bear, bear clan, bears are still the only being in creation who can hibernate and don't die because they can consume their own urine. And um, scientists still haven't figured out how they do that. There's still, there's still mystery around that. They can't figure out how do bears do that. Because that's why if we tried hibernating, we would just explode, we would die. But bears can do that. Bears can hibernate and use their own urine. But so, but like science isn't satisfied with that mystery. They still gotta go and go, well, there's an, there's a, there's, a, there's an explanation there, and et cetera. We just keep working at it and so on. And so, um, but like, there's like an acceptance of mystery as being possibility. And that I think is, a, that is that's an interesting thing that Anishinaabe people bring to the table. It's not that we don't wanna know, it's that there's, it's okay to have mystery. And that mystery eventually will unveil itself. Because you'll always eventually, you can always eventually see all of the tree. You just gotta work at it your whole life. You gotta work to keep moving. There's motion again, right? That's why, that's why Vijay Manado made motion, so that you keep moving, and you keep learning, you keep working, you keep living. And if you keep doing those things, you end up living an amazing life. Beautiful, totally life. The life that Vijay Manado saw for you. And then, that's the, what a gift. What a gift, what a way to say miigwech to your creator. And I'm not talking about a creator that's a god in the heavens or, or a god that's in wherever. I'm talking about something that is all around you. Because it's, it's not about a god that's somewhere, it's a god that's right here. Or a spirit that's a, a, a manadok that is completely that you are made out of. Breath. Okay. That's a much better note, I think. <laughs> <laughs>